Well, good morning. I do want to welcome you to Bedford Lions Church, whether you're watching online or you're here in service. I'm glad you're here today. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors. Now, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to finish a three-part series uh, on Bible characters. And if you remember, Luke started us off, and he spoke about Isaiah. And then after that, Pastor Hines spoke last week on Nehemiah. Now, both Isaiah and Nehemiah, they were what we'd consider good guys of Scripture. Today, what I'd like to do is look at a villain or a bad guy. And if, when we look at a bad guy, we can learn quite a bit, because what we want to do is learn what they do and then just do the opposite of it. Now, this person actually was responsible or instrumental in the death of John the Baptist and Jesus. I mean, think about standing before Christ someday and being held accountable, and on your resume, you're responsible of killing one of the greatest prophets and oh, the Son of God. So what I want us to look at when we look at this material is how he was confronted with truth. And yet what he did is he suppressed the truth, and his conscience became hardened, and he eventually lost his soul. And you know, this is not only true for a person, but this can be true for a nation where a nation can hear the truth but harden itself against the truth of God and therefore harden its conscience and eventually lose its soul. So let's go to the Lord in prayer before we begin. Lord Jesus, I just pray that your Holy Spirit would be moving and be working. God, I pray that you would draw us closer to you. I pray, God, that we would leave transformed and changed people. So just go before this message, I pray, in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now, my dad had 18 brothers and sisters. He was the 19th. Yes, he was the youngest of 19. Same mom, same dad. There's no divorce. It was just a big, big family. That way, if you ever go to Northeast Ohio and you come across a right, somehow I'm probably related to them. Now, I remember growing up on the right side, my dad's side of the family, we'd always, every single year, have a family reunion. And personally, as a kid, I love these family reunions because it was at a campground. There was a lot of people, a lot of food. So I really, I enjoyed it. And I remember there was this one year, I was probably about 10 years old. I went to the reunion and my uncle Dwayne put up a family tree on the side of the lodge, on the wall. And I mean, it was huge. Imagine 19 kids and then they had kids and then they had kids. It took up a whole side of a lodge on the wall. And so I remember I went and I started reading uh, the family tree. And I noticed my dad, or my Uncle Dwayne, made a mistake. And so what had happened is there's one of my aunts, and she was married to this man. And then I saw another aunt, and she was married to the same man. And so I thought he must have hit now like control copy, but it's easy to do. And so I, I went to my dad. And I interrupted him, and I said, hey, Dad, guess what? I was looking. Uncle Dwayne made a mistake. So-and-so, my aunt's married to him, and then down here, married to the same person, another aunt. And I'll never forget what my dad did. He paused, and he got a real serious look on his face. And when he was real serious, because my dad could be a very stern man, he started off, and he goes, son, you know how that son? And he looked at me, and he goes, son, there are just some things we don't talk about. I never heard the story from him again, but I did find out what happened later on. Two of my aunts divorced their husbands. Now, back then, divorce alone was like a scandal. They divorced their husbands and then just switched husbands. <laughs> Welcome to the right family. <laughs> All of its dysfunction. <clears throat> the reason I say that, though, is what I want to look at is a story of a family and a specific person that makes the story I just said to you seem very trivial, almost like the minor leagues, like T-ball. I mean, this is a type of story that I think I'm surprised Netflix hasn't made a movie out of, it, out of it. I mean, it's got power, seduction, adultery, um, murder. It's got it all. And the person I'm talking to you about and the family I'm talking to you about is Herod. Herod and his family. So if you have your Bible, turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. But as you're turning there, I need to give you some background information. And it is a soap opera. But it's true. It's, it's a true story. 
Now, I know that when I share this, you're probably not going to remember all the details. That's okay. I just want you to begin to see, when we get into Matthew 14, a little bit behind the scenes on what's going on. Now, when you read the scriptures, or I read the scriptures, in the New Testament, we read about Herod. There's many different Herods. Just like since there's many different rites, there's many different Herods. So they're not necessarily the same person. So we got to keep track of these different Herods. Now, most of us are probably familiar with Herod the Great. Herod the Great, or King Herod, was the one where the wise men come to the... Remember the wise men come to King Herod? Because they want to find out that this, this king was born, and he's surprised by it. And then remember the wise men, through a dream, go another way, and then King Herod finds out that he was tricked, and so he orders the death of all the two-year-old boys down in Bethlehem to be, um, to be killed. That is King Herod. That's Herod the Great. That's not the same person we're going to be talking about today, but that's his dad. So this is Herod the Great. Now what happens is in 4 BC, or I'm sorry, before I talk about that, let me share, I want to share this, because he's going to die in 4 BC, but he's going to leave a, a tremendous legacy. Herod the Great is a polygamist. He has at one time up to 10 wives, okay? There's no way I can talk about all of them, but I just want to talk to you about two wives that are going to relate to the story today. His first wife, or one of his wives, I should say, and this is his favorite wife. There is a person named Josephus. If you ever hear of Josephus, Josephus was a Jewish historian who wrote in the first century. So he wasn't a Christian, he was a Jewish historian. He speaks about this too, and what he shares is that Miriam, in a sense, is uh, Herod's favorite wife, and she's very beautiful. Now, Miriam and Herod have a child, a son named Aristobulus. A very, eventually, Aristobulus grows, and he's going to have a daughter named Herodias. Now, Herod was a very paranoid man, and he started to get word, and he began to believe that Miriam was going to commit treason against him. So his favorite wife, he executes. So he kills her, and kills Aristobulus, and kills Miriam's mom, and kills some others, but for right now, just understand, he kills both of That means Herodias, her dad, and her grandma was killed by her grandfather. Think that caused a little trauma in your life? Now, Herod has another wife. He's got more than that, but just there's two I want to talk to you about. Here, any guess on what her name is? Miriam. So he marries another Miriam. We'll call her Miriam II or Miriam Jr. They have a son, and his name is Philip. Okay, so it's Philip. Philip and Herodias marry. So that means Herodias marries her uncle. And they have a child, a daughter named Salome. Okay, so Herodias' daughter and Philip's daughter, his name is Salome. Now, just stick with me, because there's a lot to this soap opera. In 4 BC, Herod the Great dies. And so his land is broken up into what's called a tetrarchy, into four parts. There's only three parts I'm worried about in, in this message. Herod, and they're all called Herod's. Herod Archelaus gets this blue region. That's Samaria, Jerusalem. It's that blue region. Now, Herod Archelaus becomes to be such a wicked, horrible leader that finally Rome disposes of him, and they put in Pontius Pilate. That's how Pilate gets in control of this area. Herod Antipas, this is the man we're going to be talking about today, Herod Antipas. He gets what I guess I'd call that purple region. He gets Galilee and Perea. Now, remember, Jesus does his ministry in Galilee, so this gets very important. And then Herod Philip gets, I would call this like brown area, Batania, right there. So it's all split up. Now, Herod Antipas is a shrewd political leader. And so what he does is he enters into a marriage. Now, Herod Antipas wants to strengthen his bond with the Nabataean kingdom. Now, this right here is Perea, purple. This is the Nabataean kingdom. Have you ever heard of Petra? And Petri, I have a picture right here of how they have carved these like, places in, in stone. That's the Nabataean kingdom. King Aretas is the king of that area. So what happens is to strengthen these two um, borders, Herod Antipas 
marries King Aretas' daughter, Phasaelus. Okay, keep it a little bit, just a little bit together. All right, now is where it gets crazy. Now, remember, Herod the Great is dead. Philip and Herod Antipas, their brothers. Herod Antipas travels in 29 AD to Rome. And guess who he meets? Herodias. Now, we do not know if Herodias seduced Herod Antipas or Antipas um, seduced Herodias, but we definitely know they're very, very sketchy people, both of them. And in Rome, they commit that they are going to divorce their spouses and marry each other. So Herodias and Herod um, divorce their spouses. So Herodias divorces Philip, and Herod Antipas divorces Phasaelus. Now, Phasaelus runs at the threat of her own life because she's fearful of her own life now. She goes back to the Nabataean kingdom to King Aretas, her dad. And this Arabian king is so disgraced by what Herod did, he declares war on Herod Antipas and Perea. So a war is going to break out between these two nations, these two people groups. And think about it. There are literally soldiers who are going to die, men who are going to die simply because of the sin of a political leader. Now, so King Aretas declares war, and Salome, think about Salome. This is Herodias' daughter. Salome is, try to keep this together. Salome is uh, Antipas' great niece and stepdaughter. Now you see why I think Netflix could pick this up? Now with that, we are going to start looking in Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 1. It says this, At that time, Herod, so this is not Herod the Great, this is Herod Antipas, this is his son. At that time, Herod to Antipas, the Tetrarch, because remember, the land got split up, heard about the fame of Jesus. And he said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers at work are in him. Now think, Herod might be in his palace, but all of a sudden, John the Baptist was a very powerful preacher, and there were many who followed him. Now he hears of this preacher, this teacher that has a great following. And he is such a paranoid man. Just like his dad. His dad was paranoid. He's paranoid. He thinks, oh no. That is John the Baptist who's come back to haunt me for what I have done to him. Now what Matthew is going to do is he's going to do two things. Matthew is writing the gospel. He is going to fast forward a little bit, foreshadow something, and he's also going to flash back. What he's doing, what Matthew is doing is this. He's saying Jesus is now on the radar of the guy who killed John. And eventually to foreshadow, Jesus will stand before him and this man will kill him. It's a foreshadowing. It's also a flashback. Because at this point now, what, John, or what Matthew's going to do is he's going to explain what happened to John the Baptist. So look what he says. So now Matthew's flashbacking. John's already dead, but he's going to flashback. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison. Now this is the reason. For the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Did you get that? His brother Philip's wife. Because John had been saying, this doesn't mean he just said it once. He was saying it over and over and over again. It is not lawful for you to have her. It is not lawful for you to have her. Now, what is John? He's a prophet. He's a preacher, isn't he? And he recognizes that there is right and there is wrong. There is good and there is evil, and there is truly sin in this world, and he's calling out the sin. And I want you to think, if you're Herodias, word is getting back to her that every time this famous preacher is preaching, this megachurch pastor, he's always talking about her and their relationship with her husband, Herod. And she's frustrated. She said, I want that guy to stop preaching against us. I want him to stop calling it sin. Do you know something? I love you, Herod, 
And love is love. Who is he to say that that marriage is unholy if love is love? Can't I do what I want? Who is he to judge me? Herod, I, or I want that man. I want him dead. Now, when Matthew's writing this, you get to feel like an Ahab and Jezebel picture. And Jezebel ran the shots with Ahab. And you get this feel she's running the shots like, come on. Are you going to man up, Herod? Or are you going to be a coward the rest of your life? Are you going to do anything? So what happens, they trump charges against John the Baptist, and he's thrown into prison. But you know what sometimes I often wonder? If John was here today in our culture, in our land, and in our churches, how would we respond to him? I wonder how many people advise John. You know something, John? Your message is a little too harsh. It's, it, it's a little too, too tough. You know that? We need a little bit in your, your message, a little bit more love, a little bit more compassion. Because when you speak truth, you offend. And when you offend, they might leave. And we wouldn't want that. You're taking the wrong approach. You're, you're just being, a, John, just cool it down a little bit. A little too strong. And also, John, stay in your lane. Because every time John spoke about this issue, although it was a moral, ethical issue, it bled into politics. The reason is there was a war going on between those two nations. And it was all because of the sin that this man did. So every time he spoke about this moral issue, it would bleed into political and that oftentimes happens in the church. As pastors, we speak about moral issues. For example, abortion is something that's against God's will. It's considered murder. That's an ethical issue, a moral issue. Unfortunately, then what people then say, you're being political because it bleeds into that. But it's an ethical, moral issue. And I think if I was John, and we were talking to John, and, and people might say, you're being a little too tough. I think he's thinking, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't make sense. Because what I'm doing is I'm preaching the gospel. What is the gospel? What does it mean? Good news. The only way you can have the good news is if you understand the bad news. And you know what the bad news is? We are sinners and we need to change. We need to repent. And so John is saying, I care enough that I'm going to speak the truth so that they might get their life right and repent. But guess what happens? He's thrown into prison. Verse 5. And though he, Herod, wanted to put John to death, he, look what it says, feared the people. Isn't he a politician? He feared the people because they held him to be a prophet. I want you to contrast the two men. Both had fear. Both of them did. John feared God. And since John feared God, he was bold as a lion. Herod, the politician, feared the people. Therefore, he had no convictions, and he was a coward. And you know something? The Gospel of Mark writes about this event, too. And Mark adds just a very, very small detail that Matthew doesn't include. But it's very interesting. What we find out is when John was thrown into prison, Herod would often come and meet with him, talk with him, listen to him. Listen to what Mark says in verse, chapter 6, verse 20. When Herod heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed. While he's in prison, that's what's going on. And yet he heard him gladly. You know what that perplexed means? He's disturbed. He's conflicted inside. I truly believe John knew what he was doing was wrong, and his conscience bothered him. And he was at this point that he's conflicted because he knows what he's doing is wrong, but he doesn't really want to change what he's doing. He's perplexed. Now look what happens in verse 6. 
But when Herod's birthday came, now Josephus tells us that the Jews did not celebrate their birthdays, but the Romans did. Josephus also tells us where they were at. They are at a fortress. They're at Machaerus. Now, I want you to see where this is located. So this is a rendition of what Machaerus would have looked like. John was in the dungeon there. He may have heard the music of the party. Here at Machaerus, look where it's at. Do you know why there? Why? Remember, he, um, Herod has up here in Galilee, down here in Perea. He's down in Perea because a war is going to break out. And so he has moved to this fortress because war is imminent because King Aretas is getting ready to attack. So right now, they're at the fortress, they're at Machaerus, but what is Herod going to do? It's his birthday. He needs to relax. He's going to throw a big birthday bash. I think it's here that Herodias, who's been holding this grudge for some time, because she doesn't want John just in prison, she wants him dead. She realizes an opportunity has come her way. She knows her husband. She knows he can't handle his liquor. She knows he's a sexual pervert. She knows that when, she's with the, when he's with the guys, he gets all puffy like little man syndrome, and he just starts saying all these dumb things and promises stupid things. She knows it. And she thinks, this is my opportunity to get John, but I need somebody's help. I need my teenage daughter's help, Salome. And what you read next is what I would call R-rated. It's disgusting. Just think the party's going on. They've had their drinks. They're all in high spirits, and all of a sudden the doors open. The music starts playing, and look at verse 6, continued. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias, this is his stepdaughter. This is his great niece. Danced before the company and pleased Herod. Pleased Herod is the idea of like a sexual pleasure. It's almost the idea of like a strip tease coming in. And when you think about it, what kind of man is this guy? He is a sick man. To think he's drooling all over this teenage girl that's his own stepdaughter. And then I think, what about Slim's mom, Herodias? I mean, she's effectively pimping out her daughter to get what she wants. But oh, the plan works just the way she wants it to. Verse 7. So after she... Um, dances, it's a sexual dance. He promises, look at this, with an oath to give her whatever she asks for. What a fool. You know, he's playing the big shot, and he's like, hey, I like that. I'll give you whatever you want, Salome. You name it, it's yours. I want to be clear. Antipas' sexual addictions caused him to make horrible decisions. You can see his problem with, with Herodias. You see it now with Salome. And this morning, if you are hiding sexual addictions, these sins are going to destroy you. But they not only will destroy you, they will destroy your spouse, they will destroy your children, they will destroy your family. And you will make some of the most foolish decisions when you're sexually charged. And I believe this um, request by Salome caught him off guard. Look what she said. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. Wait, wait, wait. wait what? Stop the music. I don't think I heard you right, Salome. Wait, what did you just say? I told you I'd give you anything. You want what? You want the head of John? Wait, wait, slow, slow, slow. Let me, let me tell you. Remember you had been wanting to go to Rome on a long vacation? I'll send you there. You know, Slum, you, you want that mansion? It's yours. You can have whatever you want. No. I want the head of John the Baptist. And you know what's so sad? They don't just want to kill him. They want to make a mockery of him. 
They don't just say, I just want him dead. Just execute him. As bad as that is, just stone him, hang him, cut his head, whatever you want. What they want is to mock him by literally taking this prophet's head and putting it on a platter and parading it around in the party. Do you know what you put on platters? Dead animals that you eat. This man to them was worthy of nothing more than just being a dead animal. And all I keep thinking is this. Why did it come to this? I mean, why did it have to come to this? Do you know Herodias wanted the voice of truth silenced? Do you know when we sin, our conscience causes us to feel guilty? But what we try to do then is we try to kill the voice of truth so that we no longer feel guilty. We've got to have the voice stop. Look at verse 9. And it says this, And the king was sorry. Oh, sorry? And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he commanded it to be given. Please hear me out. We as Christians miss this so much, and we mess this up. We believe being sorry and repentance are the same thing. They're not. A person can be sorry and not repent. Judas was sorry. Herod was sorry. But there was no change. There was no true repentance. See, repentance literally means to change. That's what it means. It means to change. If a person just says, they're, now you can be sorry, and that can accompany repentance, but they are not the same. Someone can say, I'm sorry, but never change. And if they never change, it's false repentance. Verse 10. So he's sorry, but he gives in. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. You know, I've been thinking about this. What was it like for John? Do you know, nowhere does it record what John's last words were. But I wonder what they were. How he must have felt when he could probably hear the music being played, and all of a sudden an executioner comes down, grabs him, puts his head to the ground with an axe. Do you know something? John did know this. He risked imprisonment and or death if he spoke the truth, but he feared God more. Do you know something? Our society has gone in the direction of Antipas and Herodias. You can see the parallels. Our nation's conscience is dying. Anyone who speaks the truth now must be silenced. The cancel culture, hear me out, the cancel culture is not new to our generation. The cancel culture is not new to our generation. Satan has always been trying to silence the truth. See, Antipas and Herodias, they wanted to do what they wanted to do. And then they wanted everybody to improve, approve of it, of their ungodly marriage. They wanted everybody to endorse their sin. And John said, I can't do that. I cannot endorse sin. It is wrong before God. And because he couldn't endorse it, he was executed. In our culture, if we speak the truth, the cancel culture is going to rise up. They're going to say, you have no right to say that. You are just a hater. It's going to be deemed hate speech and eventually become illegal. Why? It's all an attempt to silence the truth. And we are indoctrinating. This, this is something that's bothering me so deeply. We are indoctrinating our children in the ways of sexual perversion. And then we're rejecting the truth. This is what Satan has always desired. This is his goal and his dire desire. Silence the truth because he is the father of lies. Matthew continues in verse 11. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl. She's a teenager. And then she takes it and she brought it to her mother. 
It's just not right, is it? I mean, this is a good man, a great prophet of God. And he was executed in the most grisly of way, and then he was paraded around and mocked simply because he spoke truth. But this is a foreshadowing, not of John, but of Jesus. Because the same thing was going to happen to Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And they soon were going to mock him and execute him. Verse 12. And his disciples came and they took the body. It was just a trunk. And they buried it. They gave him a decent burial. And they went and told Jesus. But you know something? In the scriptures, this is not the end of Herod Antipas' story. There's more. Do you know on Good Friday, we call it Good Friday, Jesus Christ is going to stand before Pontius Pilate. And Pilate does not want to execute Jesus. He doesn't want to deal with Jesus. And he finds out Jesus is a Galilean. Oh, that's not my jurisdiction. That's Herod's jurisdiction. So he sends Jesus to Herod. And this is what is so troubling. The voice of truth was silent. Jesus never said anything. Herod never heard Jesus speak. Complete silence. Why? His heart had become irreparably hardened. He hit a point of no return. Herod Antipas silenced the truth, and therefore the voice of truth was silent. See, when you and I or a government or a nation is confronted with the truth of God, we have one of two choices. We can hear the truth and repent and obey. Or we can disobey God and I'll allow our conscience to be hardened and seared. Hear and silence the truth and guess what? He lost his soul. A nation can silence the truth and it can lose its soul. See, John spoke the truth because the truth is only thing that would set Herod and Herodias free. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. The loving thing was to speak the truth of repentance to them, which John did. But they wanted none of it. They didn't want to hear it. And see, I keep coming back into the story where you have Herod and John speaking together in prison, and it says he was perplexed. He was on the fence. He, he was at a critical point in his life. And I just think, just go for it. Just surrender, submit. But he would not. And he rebelled against the truth. See, often I think we look at this story and we think, I am so glad I'm not here at Antipas. I'm not lost and over my daughter. I'm not signing the death warrant of someone. It doesn't really apply to me. See, the key is this. Antipas suppressed the truth and he hardened his heart. My question for you today is, do you know the truth? But you're not acting upon it. And you've hardened your heart and your conscience. See, you can come to church and like the message. Listen, Herod liked to listen to John. But he did him no good because he was unwilling to repent and change. Do you have sexual sins that are being hidden and you're not repenting of them? Are you addicted to pornography? See, you know the truth and your conscience is bothered, but you don't do anything about it. See, every time we disobey God, our heart becomes more and more and more calloused. And just like Antipas, we can hit a point of no return where God just gives us over to what we want. Our fate's sealed. That's why the author of Hebrews says this, today, today is the day of salvation. Today it is. And if we want to see change in our nation, it always starts with God's people, the church. 
I encourage you, do not mess around with God. We are dealing with serious, eternal issues. Herod messed around with God and lost his soul. You can say no and no and no and no and no and no enough that your heart becomes irreparably hardened. This morning, I'm just going to open up the altars. I can encourage you, if you're struggling with a sin, come and pray to God about it. I know you say, well, that's embarrassing. Yeah, I'm sure it is. But I would rather be embarrassed and not lose my soul for eternity. Maybe some of you, you're just feeling so heavy for your family. And you're worried about them. And you just want to come up to the altar and just pray to God for them. Maybe you're troubled with a nation that's losing its soul. And you just want to pray for our nation and repent for our nation. Maybe you want to pray for our young people because they are getting hit very hard with all forms of perversion. Maybe for some, you just want to pray for boldness because in these very difficult days, Herod wanted to please people and was a coward. But John wanted to please God, feared God. Therefore, he was bold. Nowadays, we need bold Christians who will stand strong on God's word. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, the cancel culture is not new to our generation. Satan has always been trying to silence the truth. But God, I just pray for our church that we would be bold as lions. God, we want to be a loving people, but we need to have conviction. We need to stand strong in evil days. And God, I pray that if you're speaking to anyone, that they truly would not harden their heart. God, I believe you are trying to call Herod when John spoke to him in prison. But he wouldn't have it, and he hardened his heart against you. And Lord, for the last 2,000 years, he's been lost because he lost his soul. What was it worth? The scripture says, what is a profit of man if he gain the whole world and yet he loses his soul? Lord, you are the way, the truth, and the life. And the only way we can be set free is to have an encounter with you. So please speak to our hearts. May none of us walk away from here without dealing with you. I pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand with me as we worship the Lord.